before we get started today, there are a couple things that I wanted to tell you about. The first is that Chloe and I are so excited to let you know that the course that we've been working on called Thriving Intimacy is finally ready. And we're going to be getting started on Monday, September 26th. This course is seven weeks where we are going to go in depth into our signature system for how to have an amazing, thriving relationship, deep intimacy, easeful communication, and how to experience more than you ever thought possible in a connection with your partner. So... It's uh, starting on Monday, and if you want to find out more about it, you can go to neilsatin.com slash course, or you can text the word intimacy to the number 33444, and I will send you a link so that you can find out more. And I just want to let you know, too, that we are offering it this time around at a pretty significant discount. We want to make sure that it's accessible for you. And also we're celebrating the fact that this is the inaugural run of our course. So take advantage of that. Feel free to join us. You'll also see on that page that we're offering some pretty significant discounts on coaching to help you and support you through the course. So um, definitely check it out. The second thing I wanted to tell you about is that today we had our first live webinar and on the webinar we explained our signature system and how it works and it's basically a combination of what we've learned in our work with clients, our work with each other, and also distilling the best of the best information that's been here on the Relationship Alive podcast. We talk about all of it in the webinar and I'll I'll admit if you listen to the webinar there's also a special discount code for the course so um, you'll get another $50 off the course if you listen kind of cool Anyhow, um, the way to watch the webinar, it's already happened, but it's there and available for, uh, for you for a replay. All you have to do is go to neilsatin.com slash webinar and sign up and we'll send you a link for the replay. Or I will, if you do the texting thing that I mentioned before, texting the word intimacy to the number 33444, we'll send you a link to the webinar as well well. So there were over 350 people who registered for our webinar. It was very exciting and, and it was fun. For those of you who are listening who were there, it was really great to have you there. And anyhow, so check out the webinar neilsatin.com slash webinar. Check out the course neilsatin.com slash course. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, You can always text the word intimacy to the number 33444, and I think that just about covers it. The course, again, is starting on Monday, September 21st. It will be recorded, even though we are, the course itself is live, but we'll be recording it. So, you know, if you miss the first night, it's not going to be a big deal. The recording will be there, and uh, and it's there for you. Um, All the classes are going to be recorded for you. So even if you can't make them live, we will make sure that you have the best experience possible in the Thriving Intimacy course. Okay, that's it. On to today's show with Dan Siegel. It's interesting you're starting with the the dance thing because uh, you know I met my wife on a basically on a dance floor essentially, and you know there's so much in the nonverbal way we connect and commune with each other dancing that is at the heart of you know I think how you go from two individuals being two me's to a we you know and you can. You can feel it that way dancing. So it's, I think it's a great way to start our discussion. Great. Well, let's dive in and, and we'll pick it up there. And so this, for those of you listening, we've just started this show in a, in a much less traditional way than I typically do because I start with a, hey, you're listening to Relationship Alive. But just in case you were wondering, you're listening to Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. And with me today, I have one of the world's foremost experts on interpersonal neurobiology. His name is 
Dr. Dan Siegel. And he's with us here today to talk about his work, in particular, his book, Mind Sight, The New Science of Personal Transformation. And as I was discussing with him before our conversation got started, I find that his work is a is an amazing integration of lots of the things that we've spoken about on this show. So whether we've been talking about attunement with Keith Witt in one of our earliest episodes to um, the multiplicity of selves and internal family systems with Dick Schwartz to how the body processes trauma and how to get untriggered and back to a place where you can be creative with Peter Levine and Steve Porges. These are just some examples of work that Dan integrates really beautifully um, in his concept of mindsight. And we're going to find out a little bit more about that. But let's start with the dance and how important that nonverbal aspect is of how we connect with another person. And I'm sure you can tell us a lot about where that's working in our brains and why it's so crucial to an overall experience of being in a healthy partnership and having great integration. We're going to cover a lot of ground in this conversation, so I want to encourage you to download the show guide to this episode. You can do that by either going to neilsatin.com slash mind, M-I-N-D, or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions, which will get you a link so you can download this show guide as well as all the other show guides for our Relationship Alive episodes. So make sure you do that because there's going to be a lot of information that we talk about in today's episode. And by the way, thank you, Dan, for for being with us today on Relationship Alive. Well, Neil, thank you for having me. And uh, it's a uh, an honor to be here and speaking with you and connecting with all of your listeners. You know, um, it's so important, this question of relationships and bridging from our discussion about dance, you know, it's really, uh, um, an important, uh, way we can identify the word self S E L F as a starting place for discussing dance, because, you know, in, in modern culture, we equate the self as some kind of output of the mind and, you know, often, you know, in, in academia for sure, but even in the clinical fields of uh, mental health and, and uh, education, we, we think of the self as some outcome of the, of the mind and the mind as some outcome of uh, the brain in your head. And so all of that in modern views uh, gives us a linguistic term self as separate, right? And so when you talk about dance, the dance, when it's two people dancing together, you know, is created by the weaving together of two bodies into one whole. And so if you had to say the dance has a self to it or even a mind to it, it is an integration that is an honoring of differences of the two people and then a linkage. That's how you define integration of these two entities into one. And so the dance mind reveals the relational aspect of not only our mind, but the self that comes from that aspect of mind, in this case, that's relational. So dance, I think, is a beautiful way of uh, embodying the experience of integration. And it can feel so beautiful, uh, especially, you know, I'm trained as a ballroom dancer, but, you know, my, my, my big passion and pleasure came from you know, more improvisational ballroom dance, which never made my teachers happy. But, um, <laughs> you know, it was it, it, it was something I really resonated much more with. And it was the idea that you could join with a partner in ways that weren't uh, prescribed by prior expectation. So you'd build on a disciplined, you know, knowledge of ballroom moves, but then you would combine them in novel ways that depended on how each individual was contributing to the emergence of the whole. So I, I didn't know it then, but you know, later I, you know, from as a scientist, you know, would kind of explore this fundamental idea of integration that is things in a system being honored for their differences and then linking them, like in a relationship, be compassionate, respectful, 
communication. And it turns out that that simple concept of integration turns out to be kind of a unifying principle that links relationships to even brain function. So that healthy brain function comes from integration of different parts of the nervous system to each other. And whether you look at, you know, Peter Levine's work or, or um, Steve Porges's work, you know, and look deeply at that, or even from the cell function of Dick Schwartz, you mentioned, you know, those are all wonderful uh, uh, writers who write, they don't use the concept of integration really, but they're all talking about integration. And when I've had the, the privilege of teaching with each of them, you know, what I find so enjoyable is to see how they are real scholars of this process that when you look at it from the lens of integration, ties all the different fields together from neuroscience to dance to anthropology to improv acting even, you know, and, and um, so it's, a, it's fun to have this kind of unifying principle that you can draw on where integration is the basis of well-being, basically. Yeah, and the um, what I love about it, too, is that I feel like a hallmark of healthy relating involves the ability to play and part of what creates the ability to play is this sense of developing different skills, different ways of looking at your own experience or trying to understand the experience of your partner. And, um, and there are so many avenues into that, that the more I feel like that we can expand our, our view of all those different possible ways, whether it's dancing or whether it's learning how to uh, become regulated when you or your partner is triggered. Um, those are all like these, it's like having a, a really rich palette and being a painter and saying, oh, like what we need right now is to figure out how to come back into balance so that we're not, so that we're actually operating from our prefrontal cortex and not our our reptile and limbic brain. Well, totally. You know, it's um, a reptilian brain response to threat, uh, you know, pulls us away from connection. Uh, the limbic area, when it gets activated uh, with the brainstem, can build on, you know, even thinking thoughts and having emotions that are quite separating. And in contrast to those threat reactive states, you know, you get into a more integrated state that Steve Porges probably talked about, uh, about social and the social engagement system being turned on. And um, he and people like Jacques Panksepp and other workers, you know, have contributed so deeply to understanding the brain contribution to this. And my own training is as an attachment researcher where, you know, we study patterns of communication in relationships between, say, an infant and a, uh, a mother or father, and then, you know, later on in romantic relationships. And, and so you can actually draw a connection between the profound insights of neuroscience and then the profound insights of relational science to apply them to say, well, how can I have a healthy relationship? What can I do, you know, if I haven't had such great uh, attachment experiences in the past, for example, and my brain isn't so integrated, which is basically the, the approach uh, in the different books I write about, Mindsight, as you mentioned, talks about this at length, then how can I actually try to cultivate a more integrated brain? So I do use my prefrontal cortex to keep my brain integrated so I can have this social engagement system turned on. And, uh, and amazingly, when you do that, you're given the opportunity to go from just a me to also a we. You don't get rid of your, your me, but you become also a we. And I like to think of that as an integrated identity, which is a me plus we, which equals we, M-W-E. Mm. So, uh, you know, a healthy relationship isn't dropping your separate self. It's having both that and a connected self together as a we. Yeah. So what is, uh, is, What's a good starting point from your perspective? Like when you start to work with people, you talk about this in Mindsight quite a bit, that there's a, there's some very basic um, mindfulness practices that it seems like that's, that's the starting point for how you work with people. Could you describe that a little bit more? Absolutely. You know, the, the way to think about it, you, you're talking about the book Mindsight, you know, 
Mindsight is three things. It's insight into yourself, empathy for other people, and integration, which is this honoring of differences and promoting linkages. So if you say, well, I want to have a more mindsightful you know, relationship, uh, it means you'd be more connected to yourself, more connected to others, and honoring these differences, not just tolerating them, but actually really thriving with the differences. So the first step to all of that is something called presence. Uh, and uh, I'm kind of an acronym addict, so the the one acronym we can talk about today is PART. You know, what part do you play in your life to bring more health into your relationship with yourself and others? So it would be this P-A-R-T. So the P, it stands for presence. And presence is a kind of state of receptive awareness. It overlaps with mindful awareness. It's not exactly the same as it, but because it's more uh, uh, broader, if you will, and it, 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 it's not something you have to necessarily train, but, but it overlaps with the idea of a mindfulness practice, what it would develop as presence. And in presence, you actually enter this open, receptive state that allows you to connect to whatever is going on inside of yourself. So it's like the roomy poem, the guest house, you know, invite anything in, uh, because everything, sorrows, joys, sadness, fears, everything has something to, to teach you, to offer you. And, and, and that open, receptive way is where instead of trying to contort what you're actually feeling to try to meet what you think you should be feeling, you, you have this kind of deep, deep acceptance of whatever's arising. And, you know, we have a practice uh, here at the Mindsight Institute called the Wheel of Awareness, and when people do the wheel, uh, they have a direct experience where the hub of this wheel is kind of a metaphor for this receptive presence, whereas the rim is a metaphor for everything you might be aware of. And so by doing this wheel practice, you actually literally integrate consciousness by differentiating all the stuff on the rim and then moving this spoke of attention around the rim and you allow the hub representing this knowing of awareness to, um, to become stronger and stronger as you do this. And what people have experienced is that when they strengthen access to the hub, they're deepening their capacity for presence. They become more open to whatever's on the rim. And part of that is opening a gateway to taking in the signals, nonverbal and verbal, from other people without judgment. So in that sense, it's uh, overlapping with mindful awareness. Uh, and, and mindfulness, mindful awareness, is a deep form, I think, also of, of integrating uh, the way the mind works. Uh, and in this wheel practice, which could be considered a mindfulness practice, it's really a practice to develop uh, integration of consciousness. And it, it literally strengthens your capacity to be present and it drops all sorts of rim-based um, judgments and things that may make it hard for you to be in relationship to other people or to yourself. Yeah. So, and one thing that I was struck by as you described that, particularly in the book Mindsight, is that people without that training it's they become so identified with the the whole wheel like they're they're on the rim they're the spokes they're they're kind of all over the map and this gives you that ability to um to strengthen your first your ability to give your attention to things that I think, uh, point you in the direction of where you actually want to be in your life, the kinds of experiences you want to have. And, and that that's harnessing also your brain's natural abilities to like, um, cement those neural structures and to hopefully ultimately sort of delete the ones that you pay less and less attention to over time. Well, exactly. You know, that's a beautiful way of, of describing it, Neil. And I, I, I think that, um, you know, the visual metaphor uh, of this wheel, for example, is useful to people because instead of the mind being just some murky thing that's hard to see, you actually get a metaphoric visual guide to say, okay, um, I was living on my rim and not able to see my partner in this relationship. 
So I need to keep on working at strengthening my hub, which is this receptive awareness center inside of me so that whatever he or she is, you know, feeling or thinking or experiencing or, you know, what their memories were about or how they believed something was supposed to be, I can be open to it. So, you know, the, the, the simplest way of saying it in, in um, kind of basic terms is the hub is the knowing of awareness. The rim represents the known. And even our sense of the knower, our, you know, a sense of who we are, sometimes gets lodged in this rim. So you want to really develop your capacity to just be in this receptive knowing state. It's not about knowing like I'm a smarty pants and I know more than you. It's not that at all. It's, it's, it, the words in English don't really help us as much as they could, but it's the idea that there is a knowing of awareness and there is a known, and that if you get too lost in identifying with the knowns as absolute truth or as who you are, you actually lose the capacity to be with presence. And so this is a learnable skill. It's the first part of our acronym part. And, and once you develop this presence, you move to the second one, which is A, attunement, which is a word that can be defined this way. You focus attention, which is how you stream the direction of energy and information flow, and you focus it to the inner world of yourself or others. So asking questions, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What meaning does this have for me? and then doing the same for others. It's like you sift the mind. You, I told you one acronym, now I'm doing two, but sensations, images, feelings, and <laughs> thoughts. Um, you, you check that out with another person, and so that's what attunement is, is you're in a receptive way with presence. You're now moving to the next part of the part acronym, attuning. And a lot of people um, have gotten to a habit of just reacting to behavior rather than attuning to the mind beneath behavior. And just that one shift of using mind sight instead of just physical sight, that is, we have two kinds of perceptual capacities. One is to see the physical world of behavior, that's physical sight. The other is to see the inner subjective world of feelings, thoughts, memories, perceptions, hopes, dreams, attitudes, longings, desires, beliefs, all that mental activity, that's mind sight. So, when you develop mind sight, basically, you're attuning to the mental life that's beneath the behavior that's visible with physical sight. And, and a lot of people, unfortunately, either haven't developed mind sight abilities or they don't use them because they're frightened or for various reasons just haven't gotten the habit of it. So mind sight is a teachable skill. You can learn it. And um, when I do couples therapy, I mean, it's when mind sight is absent, a relationship is disabled. And so that's a, a very important aspect of our PA, the first half of our acronym. Because when you don't attune, you don't get the second thing uh, after attunement. So your presence attunement. But the second following thing, this third part of the part acronym is resonance. So that resonating means because I'm present and open, because I'm tuning into the mind beneath behavior, that's attunement. I'm resonating, which means I'm allowing your internal world, Neil, to influence my internal state. And in, in that way, I am not, I'm not just understanding you with empathy. I'm, the resonance word is kind of a deeper kind of sense of it, is I am changed because of you. And as one of my patients said a long time ago, you may feel felt by me, not just understood, which may be true too, but it's not an intellectual thing. It's, I am changed because of you. And then you sense that there's a shift in me because of who you are. And, and that's the beginning of becoming a we, is that resonance. What's the T? And then I think I'm, I have a few little questions to, so we'll go back over that part yes. acronym, acronym. And so when yeah. another person is present, attuning and resonating, what develops is trust. That's the T. And, you know, Steve, Steve Porges, you know, wrote a beautiful book in our series. Um, we now have, I just turned in, actually just got, uh, came out this mind book, which is book number 51 in the series. 
that I'm the founding editor of nor the interpersonal neurobiology series. And so Steve's book in the series is the polyvagal theory. And in that book, it shows kind of the neurobiology of trust. So basically, with presence, attunement, and resonance, there's a shift in the brain to move from a propensity for reactivity into a state of receptivity. And you turn on the social engagement system. You activate what, what Steve talks about as the ventral vagal uh, nerve, the ventral branch of the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. And all of that being said is your, your muscles relax, your heart rate and your breathing become coherent, your way of actually perceiving the world becomes expanded, you're more open, you're more relaxed, you're receptive instead of reactive. That's the social engagement system. And so trust has a whole neurobiology to it. From a relationship point of view, this presence, attunement, and resonance, which are all relational things, then enter into your physiology. So the trust state then reinforces the resonance, deepens the attunement, and allows for the presence to have a, 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 a more prominent place within this relationship. So if you're, you know, if I'm working with a couple, for example, or if I'm out with some friends at a dinner, you know, and as let's say my wife and myself and um, uh, the other couple, I mean, you can tell pretty readily the way people are interacting. Is there presence of tomb, residence and trust, or is there not? You know, and it's draining when the other couple you're with doesn't have those four elements. You know, and then your capacity as one couple to connect with them is limited because they're reactive, they're protective, they're in a defensive mode. And it's a completely different thing than when you have trust that's a part of the relationship. Right. That just shows how those systems can expand, you know, whether it's within your family and your children or, you know, other uh, older generations or, yeah, when you're out in, in the social environment as, as a couple or on your own. Totally, totally. And, you know, it's, um, it's a profound thing to uh, think about. And I, I just wrote a chapter with um, Barb Fredrickson, who writes beautifully about, uh, in a book called Love 2.0, about love being uh, a way of uh, what she calls po having positivity resonance. And what we talked about in our chapter uh, for Paul Gilbert's book on compassion is the idea that, um, you know, the broaden and build view is that positive emotions are created with this kind of connection, this resonance, even when you're with someone who's suffering, because when someone is alone in their suffering, uh, what happens is they are literally separated from you. Um, and so you reaching out to them makes two separate entities become part of one resonating system. So you're feeling the suffering of another. And in that, the, the level of integration is increased, which I think is the source of positive emotions. And so the sense of both relief from the person who is suffering and was alone before, and the sense of reaching out compassionately and caring for another person who's in pain, increases the state of both because now these two separate individuals are joined together as a we, you know, as this you know, differentiated but linked whole uh, and, and in that you are creating a, a state of much higher integration, which is a source of positive emotional experience. Yeah, I'm sure that you've seen this with your, with your clients. I certainly have with mine where they come in and like at the very heart of their experience, they, they think that the other is out to get them. Like that's just part of their, their emotional state. And, but you can't go straight for the, for the trusts. You have to, you have to build it by giving them that experience of feeling each other's presence, feeling each other's attunement. I, I mean, it makes sense why you can't just say, Hey, you know, don't, don't you know that you have each other's best interests at heart? You know, it doesn't, doesn't right. work that way. Right. And, and it doesn't work that way also because, you know, there's so many layers of um, memory and especially a, a, a layer of, of memory called implicit memory where, you know, our partner may be saying something that activates a whole self state is what, what, what I call them. You know, the, that, that was a, a little boy being ignored by his mother. And then my wife is busy with her friends and doesn't call me in time for me to put the dinner in or whatever. And so I feel ignored and then I feel pouting. And, you know, suddenly I'm feeling like I'm going to be ignored, just like I felt ignored as a child, all that stuff. 
And because it's implicit memory and hasn't been really made sense of in my uh, processing it to what's called explicit memory and then integrated even more into a narrative, um, then what unfortunately happens is, you know, I get mad at her, I, I, I dig my heels in and say that's not right, it's wrong. And so when I then project on her this little boy isolation, irritation, you know, irate response, of course, she naturally then responds with whatever her implicit issues are. And then we're off to the races in <laughs> disconnection. Right, right. Yeah. And then we're creating a narrative that supports the, that dysfunction. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And it just reminds me of how much we could possibly talk about in this conversation. I mean, there's, yeah. there's so much. Um, uh, since you brought that up, I'm wondering if you could take a moment to describe what the process is of um, commanding <laughs> your memories from that from that implicit state where they're just occurring and informing your your current existence, but without actually being nameable as like, oh right, I'm I'm remembering that I'm I when I was a little boy, my father used to whatever. Um so how do you convert those implicit memories into something that's tangible, into a narrative that actually helps you um helps foster your your growth and your coherence? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Neil. You know, the the first thing to say is that um Becoming more uh, attuned to your own internal state and when you shift from receptivity to reactivity is very important as a starting place to do the memory work that you're talking about. And a lot of people uh, uh, don't begin there. They just dive into the memories without starting first in a more broad way. So, um, for example, I do an exercise um, – uh, with my the people I work with, you know, where I say no really harshly, and then I pause and I say yes really smooth, soothingly, as soothingly as I can, um, and they can feel the difference. With the no, you get in this reactive state where uh, it's either fight or flee or, or or freeze, where your muscles are tight and you're paralyzing yourself, or even for some people, it's faint. These four F's of reactivity: fight, flight, freeze, or faint. And the first three are activating the, the last one. The faint one is a collapse out of helplessness. So those are the four ways um, in various combinations you can experience reactivity with the no. And then with the yes, you know, people slowly move into this state of receptivity where it feels calming and opening and expansive. So the first stage is just to become aware of that. Now, when reactivity arises, and it is coming from uh, a here and now experience you're having. The key thing is that implicit memory, when it hasn't been woven together by the hippocampus of the brain from the various regions that implicit memory, like emotional memory or perceptual memory or bodily memory or procedural called behavioral memory, those are the four building blocks. and. They're all generalized in what are called mental models or schema, and those can lead to what's called priming or readying yourself for reaction. So let's say in the case we're talking about a me, so let's say I'm ignored by my mom as a kid. I don't process that in any reasonable way because it's so painful. It, it, it stays in my brain as an implicit memory. Uh, I now have a self-state that is implicitly encoding being rejected by my mom and how terrifying that is. And Part of me is angry about it, part of me is sad about it, part of me feels petrified about it and paralyzed, you know, um, so I can have many self-state facets around this particular issue being ignored by my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and then now I'm married and then my wife is busy at work and she goes out with her colleagues to get some pizza, forgets to call me and I thought I was making dinner for her and so she's, I can't reach her or whatever. And, and so then what's activated in me is a feeling of you know, being rejected behaviorally. And then even from a mindset point of view, I project into her mind, oh, she doesn't really love me. And then as a, as an implicit memory, it, here's the key thing. When it hasn't been processed, the, the retrieval of an implicit memory in pure form, 
enters awareness without it being tagged as this is coming from the past. So an emotional memory, I feel rejected and really sad and scared, but I don't go, oh my God, I'm having a recollection of when I felt scared and rejected before. No, no, no. It's just feeling that now. Hmm. In terms of behaviorally, I can feel a heaviness in my chest and a shame, like I'm no good. And that's just a bodily sensation. Perceptually, I may get images of a mother who's really uh, distracted and may project it onto thinking about my wife. And behaviorally, I may get an urge to run away, leave the marriage, you know, escape the house, go have an affair or whatever I might have. All these things that can be the flight response, you know. Um, and there may be a generalization of, oh, you know, women who love me always betray me by abandoning me or something like that. And I'm primed for all this to happen because I haven't done the work in therapy or in journal writing or in talking with my friends or even myself about it. So the key thing here is that the, the trigger, she went out with her colleagues for pizza, um, activates brain processes that are implicit only, and with their activation, they enter awareness. So it's not the same as unconscious memory. Of course, any stored memory is not conscious. But when even implicit memory is retrieved, it's fully in consciousness. The key is it's not tagged as coming from the past. So it's kind of like a flashback, if you will. And in fact, this hypothesis explains flashbacks. Um, and, and so now I'm, you know, in this flashback state, if you will, convinced she doesn't love me, convinced, you know, I'm helpless. Um, and I'm just like a kid again, literally, it's a self state of all these things clustered together. So the, the journey you're asking about, Neil, how do you move from there to integration? Because that's a non integrated memory, mm -hmm. is it requires first being aware that something needs to be done. Uh, in terms of here and now stuff, you know, I might want to do some journal writing. I might want to do some walking around the block so I'm not blasting my wife with a bunch of implicit garbage that I'm going to shove onto her uh, because that will just inflame her, of course, and then she'll withdraw from me, which will reinforce every bit of that implicit par uh, pattern that I just described. Right. Oh, she really doesn't love me, et cetera, which is what happens. So there's, an, there's a set of reactions where I evoke from the relational world my worst nightmare. Right. It shows how those those little beliefs or implicit memories that are running with you can totally shape your experience if you're not aware of it. And they shape my experience um, both uh, literally inside of me emotionally and I can evoke from the world, in this case, my wife, reactions from her that will be parallel to what actually my mother actually did. And the research on attachment is very clear about that. Kids evoke from their teachers ways in which their parents, who the teachers never met, treated them. Yeah. So wow. this, is, this is like this self-reinforcing pattern of implicit memory. So, you know, Mary Hartzell, my daughter's preschool director, and I am actually looking out over at her preschool. She's retired now. But um, when my daughter was in preschool years ago, um, I wrote a book called The Developing Mind, and then she and I were teaching workshops, and we wrote a book called Parenting from the Inside Out, which walks parents through, and really it's good for anyone in any relationship, you know, how to do just what you're asking. How do you understand implicit memory? How do you go back and then take these unintegrated implicit elements of your early experience, recognize they need to be integrated, and do the work? So the work of integration requires... First, that you're not in the heat of fighting with your spouse or partner because you're not going to be receptive to your own experience and you're just going to be reactive yourself. So, you know, the first is like relational first aid. So if you're reactive, for the most part, nothing positive happens right. in a relationship when you're reactive. So, you know, you're reactive and go take a break, get some water to drink, take a stretch five minutes, three hours, whatever it takes <laughs> until you're receptive. But you're going to need to do some inner work. This is why we call it parenting from the inside out. Both it's parenting from the inner mental experience out, but it's also parenting yourself from the inside out. So you have to bring into awareness these implicit elements 
And as the hippocampus gets activated with what's called focal attention, that's attention bringing things into consciousness, into awareness, they actually do with what my memory mentor, Bob Bjork, called uh, uh, memory retrieval is a memory modifier. So you're actually changing the form of a memory by bringing it into consciousness, making it explicit when it was only implicit before, and almost like assembling puzzle pieces together, you not only get a whole puzzle piece assembly so you can see what it was all about, but then you can go from explicit memory, which is what we're talking about, of autobiographical memory, myself in time, this happened to me with my mom, I'm projecting this now into my wife. Those are all explicit memories. And now when I retrieve them, as they go back into storage, now they're explicit so I don't get confused. You see, explicit memory of two kinds is autobiographical, self in time, is factual. I know this happened, you know, then. Um, so both factual and autobiographical memory, when they're retrieved into awareness, you have a sense they're coming from the past. And now you get the next level of integration, which is called narrative integration, where you're not just assembling the implicit elements as puzzle pieces into the puzzle piece assembly. You're now making meaning of the madness. So you're making meaning of memory. And now I'm saying, look, there's a theme in me where I'm sensitive to rejection. It's when the dog goes to my wife instead of me, when the neighbors go to my wife instead of me, when my wife goes out for pizza with her colleagues instead of calling me. This is my issue. So I have a, a narrative theme. Dan is sensitive to rejection. So I have to be careful because I'm going to create my own worst nightmare. So I start yelling at my partner, my wife, instead of saying, you know something, I had a big feeling of hurt that I've got to work on. But I also want to work on us having better communication because I thought you said you were coming home at six for dinner. And I couldn't reach you till 830. I made dinner and it's all cold now. So I'm just confused. <laughs> so maybe we can work together on improving communications, which is totally different than saying, how dare you not come home for dinner? You told me you're going to come home for dinner, blah, 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 blah. Right, right. It's a completely different outcome. And that process of creating a narrative if I'm understanding you right, it seems like it's important to actually write it down or to, to construct the story that that's activating a different part of your brain that allows you to to integrate different functions. The, the part of your brain that's having that that experience, which, you know, as I'm remembering back to mindsight, that would seem like it's more of a right brain kind of thing. And then you're engaging your left brain in in helping process and make sense of that experience. Well, Neil, exactly. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the amazing thing when you look at some of the basic uh, brain science about it is that autobiographical me memory is primarily stored in the right, but the drive to tell a story, which is basically defined by Jerry Bruner's, the linear telling of a sequence of events when it's in language form, of course, we can tell stories in dance. We can do it in music. We can do it in poetry. Um, but the usual narrative storytelling thing is a left hemisphere driven linguistic, linear, logical process. Um, and so left and right join together. And so it's a deep bi hemispheric bilateral form of integration. And James Pennebaker's work, for example, in journal writing shows it's, it's even helpful to go beyond just talking about it, but actually writing things down literally in a journal. There's something that seems to be very special about the process of writing, uh, I, I, I find that myself as a writer, you know, writing books that um, like this new mind book, for example, you know, it, it's a sort of a professional memoir, if you will, looking at the last 40 years of my life and asking the question, you know, what is the mind and is there a way to blend, you know, personal experience, experience with my patients and, you know, experience with uh, you know, um, uh, science into one view. And it was very, very integrating for me to actually write it for sure. Yeah. I'm, uh, writing, I'm working on a book. My, my listeners are familiar with this with my partner, Chloe. And 
at the process of writing the book together has led us to think that we should start teaching courses on uh, encouraging couples to write books together as a way of really coming to understand each other, the different dimensions of each other and how you think about the world. And so you have that like self integrative experience of writing and then it, you can bring that into partnership if you're able to foster that kind of creativity and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it's very, it's very exciting because here's, you know, if, if someone's um, a professional listening to this, of course, there's lots you can do. If you're a person just in a relationship and you want to know for yourself what you can do, what's so exciting about it is that, you know, when you think about integration, it is a very doable um, process systematically. What I tried to do in the book Mindsight you know, is to explore uh, how people can actually use this in their day-to-day -day life, in their relationships, in their internal world, so that they can know exactly how to develop more integration across a number of different domains that, you know, I talk about there. Yeah, I, um, I, I feel like we, we covered a little bit about, like, how someone who's more immersed in their right brain experience might become a little more left brainy and, and integrated that way. Mm -hmm. um, would it be worth it to take a moment to, to talk about how someone who might identify as more left brainy, more kind of logical and detached and how, what's a process that they might go with to become more connected to their right brain experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, um, the basic idea is that, um, with someone who's excessively left brained, um, they're more distant from, you know, what's going on in, in their body. So the, the right hemisphere takes in the signals from the body, for example, uh, autobiographical memory, as we've discussed, is more in the right brain. Um, sensitivity to nonverbal signals is more right brain. So those three things, the body, autobiographical memory, nonverbal signals, mean that in the left, it's more linguistic, that is language-based. It's more um, A to B to C to D in a very logical, linear kind of way. Um, and, you know, seeing the mind of someone requires both hemispheres. And either way, if you're only right, only left, in, in broad terms, it makes it hard. You want to have both involved. It's about integration, not about favoring one or the other. Hmm. So the, the um, I think the nice thing about this approach is you say, well, okay, if someone's left dominant, which a lot of people who have what's called avoidant detachment, which about 20% of the population have, you know, their partners often feel very lonely because the resonance, which is predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly in the right hemisphere realm of nonverbal signals and bodily sensations is not really happening. And so a partner will often feel lonely. They really won't know why, even if the words their partner is saying are kind of the proper kinds of words, they still may feel quite, um, you know, quite uh, confused by it because um, they're just not feeling connected. They just don't feel connected. So it's a really, uh, you know, it's a powerful way to think about it and say, okay, well then, Basically, a, the left dominant person, I talk about a guy named Stewart who was 95, no, he was 92 when he came in uh, for the first time. Uh, you know, he was extremely left dominant and extremely disconnected from his uh, family members uh, and even from himself. And you can see the work of what he needed to do to cultivate his right hemisphere and get that more uh, on, online, you know. So that the work would be basically be in touch with your bodily sensations, get in touch with the capacity of nonverbal signals being perceived in another person, begin to develop more of your access to autobiographical memory. And in the course of all that, you start developing the circuitry of empathy. So a lot of times people start feeling directly, you know, this way where they're um, beginning to feel truly connected to someone else. And I remember with Stuart, in the beginning of his therapy, I felt very alone in the room. And then there were these moments when it became clear it wasn't just me in the room and him in the room as it had felt, you know, kind of isolating, but there was a we that was developing. And that's 
you know, that's the kind of thing you want to see in someone who's, um, you know, uh, doing the work to move to a more integrated way of being. Yeah, yeah. And I also like how you describe that the more you get to this integrated place, the more, I think you call it an approach state, the more you're able to actually lean into the challenges and the things that life is throwing at you. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. So if you're yeah. going to go ahead. No, please. Yeah. So I was just going to say, if you're going to lean in and, and um, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. But before I do, I just want to mention to our listeners that we're, we will have a detailed show guide for this episode, which you can download if you go to neilsatin.com slash mind, M-I-N-D. Uh, or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and you can, uh, you'll get a link to a page where you can download this show guide and all of the show guides from all of our episodes over the past year at this point. So I encourage you to do that because we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so sometimes it's helpful to go back and, and read it um, afterwards. Um, but Dan, what I was wondering is um, if we could go back to the beginning and talk about the presence piece and and give our listeners like they're going to go home after totally inspired and they're going to buy your book Mindsight, but they're also going to want to like put something into practice. And I'm wondering if you can give them a taste of like entry into the wheel of like how what's something that they could do in a way that they can develop that sense of themselves as the hub um, yeah well yeah. first of all you know we have available to everybody you know if you go to the website dr dan siegel d-r-d-a-n-s-i-e-g-e-l.com if you go to resources then just go to click on the um the tab on resources and then get over to the wheel of awareness you can start practicing it yourself it's a very powerful practice that I, I do it every day and it's um, we've gotten great feedback from the many many people who've uh, downloaded it and so it is a practice that literally will let you develop more integration in the first domain of uh, integration which is the domain of consciousness and what a lot of people experience is when they strengthen their capacity to sit in this metaphoric hub of knowing which the practice teaches you how to do they can move the spoke of attention around this rim to all the different things like what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, these first five senses. You then go to the interior of your body called interoception, which is the gateway, by the way, of empathy and insight. It's a source of deep bodily wisdom. You experience that. You then move the spoke over to the third segment of the rim, which is um, basically exploring your feelings, your thoughts, your memories, things like that. So instead of just overly identifying with them or them taking you over from the hub, you actually get to explore them in this very empowering way. You then, in the more advanced one, can actually explore the hub itself, which is kind of cool. Uh, you know, or if you do the early one, you can skip that stage. But then you move over to the final segment of the rim, which is the relational sense. And this is where we have a sense of connection to other people and on the larger environment we live in. And, and so you can try it yourself. You know, what I talk about in the Mindsight book is how to use it. In the Mind book, um, uh, this journey to the heart of being human, I talk about kind of what the deep science of it is about, because now I've done it with over 10,000 people in, in person and have recorded the results. So I summarize the results for the first time in, in Mind. And what is really, really exciting about it is there's a, uh, when you see the, the science view of what that hub may really mean, it shows you how presence in relationships is actually not only good for the relationship, it's really good for yourself. So studies are showing all sorts of improvements in enzymes that repair the ends of your chromosomes uh, in ways that you have um, uh, improvement in your immune function. All sorts of physiological benefits come from these practices like the wheel. And you also get the benefit of increasing presence, which is the beginning of presence, attunement, resonance, and the cultivation of trust. Amazing. Well, we will definitely have links to your site, drdansiegel.com, um, as well as directly to your resources page so that our listeners can go and check that out. So those links will be in the show, show guide for this episode or on the website. Um, Dan, 
your your new book is coming out in November. Is that right? It'll be out October 18th. October 18th. Yeah. Great. So keep an eye out for that. And hopefully we can get you back on the show to talk a little bit more about that new book as well. And um, in, Great, the mean- I'd be happy to. in the meantime, thank you so much for the gift of your time and your wisdom and your work integrating all of these various aspects of how to um, how to transform your mind and how to actually uh, harness the power of your mind to live a more actualized, integrated, fulfilling life. I really appreciate your work and really appreciate your taking the time to be with us on the show today. Thank you, Neil. It's an honor and thank you for all your work. It's really, really great. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, Please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive Community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.